when I think about clutter and decluttering, mm. clutter is debris in the road. It is not a destination. Mm. And the same thing is true with decluttering. Decluttering is not the end result. It's not your end game. It's not your goal is to simply declutter. This podcast has bad words. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. Ryan Nicodemus is not here today because guess where he is? He's, of course, at Burning Man. Oh, it's that time again. <laughs> <laughs> He'll be there, well, the next couple of weeks, but then we'll have him back in a few weeks to do a full debrief. But don't worry. In the meantime, we've got my good friend and co-host, TK Coleman. Hey, hey, hey. What's up, everybody? And that beautiful voice you hear in the background. That's Malabama. Hi, everybody. The rest of our team is here as well. Danny Unknown. We got post-production Peter listening somewhere. Professor Sean is here in the studio twisting a bunch of knobs for us. Coming up today <laughs> on this free public minimal episode, a caller has a question about whether she's decluttering too slowly. And another listener has a question about letting go of coupons she might not use for a while. Then we've got our lightning round segment, a live stream question, and a listener tip for you. You can check out the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 410, where we answer five times the questions and we dive deep into several simple living segments. That private podcast episode is out right now. Patreon.com slash The Minimalists. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free because sing along at home, y'all. Advertisements Advertisement suck. suck. Let's start with our callers. If you have a question or a comment for our show, you can give us a call 406-219-7839 or email a voice recording to podcast at theminimalists.com. Our first question today is from Perry. Hi. So I have recently started to wonder if my clutter is an anxiety crutch. I suspect I may be holding on to clutter and decluttering slowly because I find that it, I find that to be easier than the big things I want to do. I think I'm afraid of finishing the decluttering because then I'll have to face either the anxiety of emptiness or those big dreams that feel so daunting. I'm anxious about working towards those dreams because of a fear of failure. Do you have any tips for me? Thanks. Perry, this is certainly something that I've gone through in my own life, decluttering, organizing especially, so not even the decluttering part, but organizing as a practice of procrastination. Mm. Mm. I have something to do. In fact, I'm thinking about my daughter who's 10 now, but I remember when she was around five and anytime we wanted to get her to do something she didn't want to do, her favorite phrase was, but I've got to do something first. I got to do something. And it oh, yeah. didn't matter. She didn't even know what it was, but like, hey, it's time to brush your teeth before bed. Or, but I've got to do something first. Aww. Yeah. And isn't that what we're talking about here? Because I think what Perry's talking about is, hey, I'm decluttering kind of slowly. Mm. And that can be great because you don't want it to feel frantic, but also, am I procrastinating by putting these tasks in front of me? Oh man, we see that with calendar clutter all the time, but really it applies to anything. Busyness is a defense mechanism that we erect to protect ourselves from the world's demands. I think about when I worked at the restaurant, if you were ever in the weeds and you needed help, someone needs to run food at this table for me, you look around at the faces of your teammates and the people that seem stressed, you leave them alone. They're busy. But the people that seem happy, oh, they can take something to do. And we learn very quickly in life that if we walk around looking too relaxed, looking too free and too happy, someone might give us something to do. Someone might demand something of us. So we learn how to look busy, sound busy, look stressed, sound occupied, because if my plate is full, then you'll be less inclined to add something to it. And so that mentality can get into our subconscious and govern so many things. But in the same way that you don't accumulate clutter overnight, you also don't have to deconstruct your life overnight. You don't have to follow all of your dreams and face every single desire and conquer the emptiness that the clutter is covering up all in one shot. Just as you give yourself permission to evaluate things and eliminate them one step at a time, you can do that with your goals and your ambitions and the emptiness that you're wrestling with. 
And the opposite can also be true. Let's say, I remember when I was obese as a kid, and it took years to become obese. It didn't take the same number of years to lose the weight. And then I became obese with material possessions. So I was metaphorically overstuffed with stuff. I had a lot of excess things, and it took years, over a decade, Mm. to accumulate all of the stuff. But it didn't take a decade. I didn't have to remove the things one item at a time in perpetuity. Although sometimes that does help. Starting slow, not just renting a dumpster and throwing all your stuff in it. Now, if you can do that metaphorically, I think that makes a whole lot of sense. I'd prefer to recycle or or sell some of the things or donate many of the things and not simply throw them away. But if you could just let go of everything. In our last book, Love People Use Things, which, Perry, I'll send you a copy of Love People Use Things because there's this great story in there of this couple, the Kirkendalls, whose entire house burned down and they lost everything. But they had been simplifying up until that point. And they realized like they were letting go aggressively. And that letting go aggressively made room for them to actually lose everything. And it wasn't as devastating as Mm. it would have been six months previous. However, when I think about clutter and decluttering, Mm. clutter is debris in the road. It is not a destination. Mm. And the same thing is true with decluttering. Decluttering is not the end result. It's not your end game. It's not your goal is to simply declutter. The declutter is a tool, the same way a hammer is a tool. Buying the hammer was not the purpose of the hammer. You use the hammer for something. You're going to nail something together. You're going to build a house. You're going to build a shed. You're going to build something with this. And with decluttering, you are building a life, not through addition, but subtracting the things that are in the way so you're making room for something else. And right now, I think what Mm -hmm. Perry's saying is, I don't really know what that is. She said those big dreams, right? Yes. But are you specific about what those dreams are or are they really nebulous? Because if you're really specific about what they are and those dreams are compelling enough, you're going to want to get the stuff out of the way. And no, it may not happen overnight, but it can happen in a month. You can play the 30-day minimalism game. You can download the free calendar at theminimalists.com slash game. You could find a friend to play with because having someone there to also help keep you accountable allows you to not declutter so slowly that you're getting in your Mm -hmm. own way. Yeah. I think about this question in terms of my injury. When you have an injury and you want to get back to normal life, to things like working out, there are two extremes you can play. The first extreme is to say, I'm just going to go all in in the way life used to be, high intensity. The other extreme is to say, I'm going to wait until I feel 100% before I do anything that is remotely challenging. But in between that is physical therapy, right? Where you say, I'm not going to wait until I'm 100% before I challenge myself, but I'm also not going to put the pressure on myself to be high, intense, and fully ready today. I'm going to do a little bit at a time. And so what I would say when it comes to this decluttering process, you can map out these extremes in the same areas. You can say, I'm not going to wait until I'm done with the decluttering process to pay attention to my dreams but I'm also not gonna pressure myself to just go all in and make my dreams happen overnight. And so what you can do is while you're decluttering a little bit at a time, you can take five to 10 minutes a day to say, I don't need to do anything about my dreams, but I'm just gonna journal about it for five minutes today. I'm just gonna sit with it and ask myself, hey, what is it that I have been avoiding and why have I been avoiding that? What might life look like If I gave myself permission to say yes to something that makes me feel inspired, what are some things that it would give me joy to delve into? And just a little bit at a time, and you'll find that those two things, the decluttering and the dreaming, will work hand in hand, step by step. And finally, I think it's important to have some sort of boundaries in your life. Mm -hmm. And the boundaries make sense for several reasons. A, if you don't have any boundaries, you might just keep decluttering, decluttering. Now you think this is the point of what you're doing. But as I said a moment ago, that's not the destination. It is simply a vehicle, or actually the clutter is a is debris in the road that's getting in the way, preventing you from getting to your destination. But too often we think as soon as everything is perfect, 
then I'll be set for life. I'll be in a fixed state. But the opposite is true. Your life will change, and so the things you need will change. The things that add immense value today may not add value tomorrow or next year. So you have to be willing to continue to Mm. question and write those things down even. Question, is this adding value to my life? And also, you have to be willing to bring new things in if you're certain that it meets your criteria, it matches your boundaries. So we have a minimalist rule book. It's called 16 Rules for Living with Less. You can download it for free. Anyone listening to this can download it for free at theminimalists.com slash rulebook. And really, all those are 16 different boundaries. They're adjustable to get you started on your journey of letting go. Our next question is from Kai. Hi, The Minimalist. This is Kai calling from Vancouver, Canada. Um, I'm a Patreon patron. This is my first time sending my voice memo. Um, I do have questions regarding uh, coupons. I know you talk about this before, uh, but these coupons came in the products I purchased online. Um, Usually they're 10, 15, 20% off. So I'm keeping them. They're on my fridge. Um, but every time when I look at them, they're such clutter to my eyes. I want to get rid of them, um, but I also want to keep them just in case I need to buy in the future. Um, I know I use the word just in case, um, but I have ha- same thing happened to me before. Um, right after I got rid of some of the coupons and I want to buy something from the company and now I have to pay regular price. Um, so what would you do? Thank you very much. Kai, what would I do if I were in your shoes? There's something I often think about. If it feels like a no, let it go. Now, how do I know whether or not something feels like a no? Whether it's a material possession or it's a coupon that a corporation gave me or it's a relationship or it's a meeting or an obligation, could be a friendship. If it feels like a no, Mm. let it go. How do I know that it is a no? Because it's not a hell yes. In hell yes, the spirit of hell yes is, oh, I can't believe I get to own this. I can't believe I get to have this. I can't believe I get to go to this concert with you. I can't believe that I get to have this friendship. Doesn't mean it's going to be flawless. There's going to be tension with anything that we bring into our lives if it doesn't meet our expectations 100% of the time. I'm not talking about your expectations here. What I'm talking about is if it doesn't feel like hell yeah, then it's a no. And if it's a no, it's okay to let it go. It doesn't mean that you won't feel a slight twinge of of discomfort and maybe even a little tiny bit of regret for letting Mm. something go. But that is the price of your freedom. Yes, It is so freeing to let go of those things that might serve you in some non-existent hypothetical future. You're holding on to something just in case. As you mentioned there, of course, those are the three most dangerous words in the English language. Now, let me get practical for a moment, and then I'll hand it over to TK, and we can get even more philosophical here. But practically... If I were in your shoes, I would let these coupons go. But if I also felt like, yeah, these aren't just in case. There are a few I'm certain I'm going to use just for when. And I knew that I wanted to use them. I'd simply take photos of them and I'd have them available. And if I needed to print them back out, I could. Also keep in mind, usually these coupons have an expiration date written on them. Now, that expiration date isn't real. It's manufactured to create a sense of urgency in you because they want you to buy something this quarter because it helps their fiscal quarter. It helps their profitability. And they they have a fiduciary responsibility to increase their profits. And the way they do that is to add an expiration date to your coupons. Now, what would I truly do personally as JFM? I would get rid of them. I don't use coupons. I'm not saying that you shouldn't use coupons, but the reason I don't use coupons has nothing to do with saving money, is saving my sanity. The psychological clutter that is caused by, oh, I should hold on to this little trinket. We we pretend that coupons are savings vouchers from a benevolent corporation. Yeah. And oh, they want me to save money. How kind is this corporation? But the truth is, they want me to spend my money with them. And I'm okay with spending my money, but I don't like being pressured into spending my money. So would I buy it at full price? 
If so, great. I'll still buy it at full price. Now, if there's a discount at the register and they say, hey, we'll give you five bucks off right now. Cool. I'm not going to turn down your five dollars. But the mental clutter, the emotional clutter and the psychological clutter that is caused by coupons for me, it's just not worth it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Have you ever uh, bought anything and you go to the register and you don't have one and someone says, oh, there's a coupon for this. Yes. And they give it to you, you know. Uh, Anyway, you know, our relationship with things is so funny because all of the minimalism dilemmas boil down to this sense of, hey, I really hate having this thing. Also, I really want to keep this thing. <laughs> which which one of those desires do I choose to be loyal to? And it's not always easy to know which because sometimes what we really want is to keep the thing and we just feel guilty about what we really want. And other times we really want to get rid of the thing, but we feel guilty about the story we'd have to tell if we got rid of it. So what do you do? Well, if you had said, I have this neat little drawer in my kitchen and I keep my coupons in there just in case I need them. And I just love having that space. What do you guys think? There would be nothing we could possibly say other than enjoy. Sounds like you're doing something that you love. But that's not what you said. You said, I don't want to keep them. I want to get rid of these things. They're clutter. And you probably don't want to get rid of them because you have TV cameras broadcasting your refrigerator on the news every night saying, look at this person with all of these coupons. They're not a good minimalist. It's bothering you in some kind of way. And so the question I would ask is, what is your clutter costing you? I would sit with that for a minute. Not because coupons are so important that you should spend hours thinking about them, but because problems tend to manifest in a variety of different ways. And when you take the time to understand the principles that underlie one problem, you get the chance to apply that wisdom to many other things. And so I would ask with this particular instance, what is this clutter costing me? And is that worth the 20 cents? You know, when I travel, man, I observe a very interesting thing. People compromise their peace in all sorts of ways to save 30 seconds here, 60 seconds there. And I don't condemn it. It's totally all right. But one thing I've done to really improve my quality of life is I've made up my mind that unless I am late for a meeting and I'm going to rush to get somewhere, I am not going to abandon my quality of life just to save 30 seconds. So when I come down from a flight and, you know, I'm, I'm going through security and there's someone, you know, uh, not, not coming down from a flight, but going to a flight and I'm going through security and there's someone racing me and the only way to get in line in front of them is to compete and to rush them. If I'm not late for my flight, I'm going to let them be the one to win that 30 seconds. And I'm just going to enjoy my life and enjoy the peace of traveling light. And I think that's something that we can apply to life as well. There are so many opportunities to save 20 cents here, to save two bucks there, to save two minutes. But what are you giving up for that opportunity? If you're giving up your peace of mind, is that, is that your price? Is that the price of your soul? Yeah, I gave up my peace of mind because I wanted to save 20 cents. I don't <laughs> or $20. Think it's $20. Yeah. You know, what's the price of your peace of mind? Oh, it's so good. You're reminding me of three things. One, recently, while I was down here in LA, my wife was up in Ojai and our daughter was out of town and she was like, hey, is it okay with you if I get rid of some things this week? And of course, me being the good minimalist that I am, I said, well, yeah, of course, that sounds great, right? Yeah. We're constantly antagonizing and questioning our our material possessions. What are you doing here? Oh, do I, I, I get value from that. Okay. But I always want to interrogate my things. Yeah. And that's what Perry, or that's what Kai is doing here with these coupons. She's interrogating them right now. Yeah. And brava for that. And so Bex texts me and she's like, hey, uh, is it okay if I get rid of some things around the house? And I say, yeah, that sounds great. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And then of course I get home and there's a little box by the curb because in our neighborhood, we simply have this like donation system. People come by and they just leave stuff on the curb and yeah. people pick through it and they take what they want. And it's a beautiful thing. But I get there and I'm like, oh, wait, I didn't know she was getting rid of this. I didn't know she was getting rid of this. Yep. Uh-oh. But then I said, hey, this is, this is the cost that I'm willing to pay. I'm willing to let go of some things that I thought I wanted to keep. But she didn't want them here. And I can still hold on to it in my mind. And that's going to make me more miserable, even though the thing is gone now. It's on our curve. I'm not going to take it back in the house at this point. Mm -hmm. But I realized that, oh, I can let go of any of these these things. Even the things that I think that I want, 
I can let go of those. And even that as a practice, it stretches my comfort or my discomfort zone. And that is a place from which we grow. And so letting go of some of the things that we're holding on to mm-hmm. just in case, even things that you know you will use or likely are going to use in the future, man, that is almost a spiritual practice. It's not asceticism so much as it is questioning the things that you get value from. I was just talking to my brother in Chicago this past weekend who owns an uh, apartment building there, and he had a hoarder who just recently moved out. This person um, rented one of those huge blue colored construction uh, garbage bins and filled it up completely. He personally took out about 20 bags. This person moved and took a lot of their stuff And this place is still filled with days of work. He described so many things that were astonishing. This person is a true hoarder. Uh, One of the things he described is, he says, there was one room where it was like a room full in in like a a two bedroom apartment, a room full of condiments, like fully packaged, never opened, barbecue sauce, seasonings, salt, pepper, all these types of things. And he says, this person just had this compulsion. They see something, it's a deal and they buy it. So he calls Salvation Army and they're like, hey, like we don't serve that area. He calls some other places. They're like, ah, we're not taking anything for a few weeks. And so he goes in there to try to gather some of the things to maybe see what he can throw away, what he can give away. And as he's looking through things, that demon tempts him. He says, well, I can't throw this away. This is valuable. I can't, maybe I should take this home and keep it in my home. And that's the trickiness with clutter. It has a way of saying, hey, you don't want to waste me, do you? And then we say, no, nah, I don't want to waste you. And then that demon says, good, let me live in your home so I can waste your peace of mind. I can waste your happiness. I can waste your life energy. I can waste your creativity all in the name of you not being a wasteful person. But as I've said before, you better trash that stuff before it trashes your life. You got to let go of the guilt that says, It would be wasteful of me to get rid of something. Therefore, I'm going to consume something that isn't healthy for me, that isn't good for me. I'm not saying you should mindlessly throw things away, but take the time, do the work to find somewhere, someone that you can give that away to so that you're not wasting your life in the name of being resourceful. TikTok that, Danny Unknown. My goodness. Uh, Two things that come to mind here. Practically, you just mentioned the things that they're collecting like condiments and expired things, right? And we talked a moment ago about how the coupons themselves expire as well, right? But I'm also thinking that the discount doesn't actually expire if you know how to ask for it. My Mm. friend Julian Smith, who's been on this podcast before, we've done some tour stops with him, and I wrote a blog post with him years ago, but he, he taught me this really valuable life lesson, this experiment. For one year, one day a week, no matter what you're buying that day, he had me negotiate for it. Now, that could be something as simple as you're at Starbucks and the coffee's $2.85. And to say, hey, can I get a discount on that? Now, most of the time, you would think they'd be like, well, no, we can't. Almost always, they say yes. Even at the grocery store, I've been told, oh, yeah, I, could, I got a coupon or whatever. And what you're realizing here is that those coupons you're holding on to aren't the only way to save money. The easiest way to save money is to not spend it in the first place. Yeah. Don't buy the things you don't need to impress people you don't know or don't like. Yeah, That's a great way to save money. But beyond that, You can be at the checkout line at Target and you can ask for a discount. What's the worst thing they're going to say to you? No. I'm sorry, I can't do that. Or they'll just smile and laugh or they'll look confused. But it also makes you more confident in your purchasing experience. Now, also, you'll probably notice whenever I'm talking to people at like a cashier at at a grocery store or at a restaurant somewhere, I'm talking to someone, I'm fairly gregarious. It came out of that experiment because I was forced to push through the discomfort of, all right, I'm going to ask them for a discount. And it made it so much easier to talk to people because you become you become acquainted with rejection. And that rejection becomes a muscle, that discomfort that you experience, and it becomes so much easier to actually get the discount, and I don't have to cling to any sort of coupon. One last thing. Hmm. 
I was at a concert last night. I surprised my wife with Sigaros, who's our favorite band. They're amazing. They're from Iceland. Jonzi, he is the lead singer of the band, and he is like Mozart with Michael Jackson's voice. That's the best way I can describe him. This beautiful falsetto. They had a 50-piece orchestra on the stage. It was unbelievable. And this woman walks up to me during the intermission. Her name was Jessica. And she walks up. She goes, I saw you here. And I just knew it was my sign to get my shit together. Wow. (laughs) Good on you, Jessica. (laughs) Hey, that's awesome, man. And I want to say to Kai, and I want to say to anyone listening to this, maybe this is your sign to get your shit together. If it's feeling right now like you're overwhelmed by material possessions, or you feel like, ah, I've been meaning to declutter. I've been meaning to let go. I've been meaning to simplify my life. Maybe this is your sign. It's okay to let go. If it feels like a no, let it go. And this is your time to get your shit together, not because you're a screw up who would be a bad person if you didn't get your shit together, but because you are beautiful and brilliant more than you can imagine. And it's time for you to start saying yes to that and time to start getting rid of the stuff that's keeping you from doing that. Amen. Alabama, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your questions from TikTok. Yes, indeed. You can follow The Minimalist on TikTok and Instagram and uh, Facebook and Twitter, which is now called X. Also, this platform threads we're on now. At The Minimalists is our handle. Now, during the lightning round, We each have 60 seconds to answer your question with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We'll put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you'd like. Jennifer has a question for us. Do lower income folks tend to spend more frivolously than higher income folks on luxury goods such as shoes, cars, jewelry and clothes? I sometimes feel like people are trying to prove something to others by how much they can afford, even when they really can't. I fully realize that rich people also buy lots of excessive things, but I'm just curious what you guys think of this. Jennifer, we definitely call this signaling, but I'd like to hear what TK has to say about this. You got something pithy for us, TK? Yeah, um, the wastefulness of the rich is a luxury that the poor cannot afford. You know, people often ask, isn't minimalism just for people that have more cash than they'll ever need and can afford to accumulate a lot of clutter? Not necessarily, because the inability the inability to afford a thing doesn't equate to the power to avoid a thing. You still have to live in a world that's showing you a bunch of things that, although you can't afford, is telling you you are not enough if you lack possession of these things. In addition to that, there are so many people that are eager to exploit you and they're searching for ways to make it easier for you to buy the things that you can't afford at the low, low cost of your freedom, your flexibility, and your future. So just because you have lower income doesn't mean you have lower vulnerability because people that are poor don't just lack access to capital. They often lack access to support networks, access to mentorship, access to the education to make powerful and important life-giving decisions. And so many people who are rich can afford to be reckless and they can afford to ignore the price tags and make bad decisions. When you're poor, you not only have an inability to afford a lot of luxury goods, but you also have an inability to afford to make stupid decisions because you don't get away with it. And so I think it's a tragedy and it's why the message of minimalism and simplicity truly is for everybody especially the people that can't afford the traditional forms of clutter. I had to learn this the hard way. Give me 60 seconds, Professor Sean. I got something pithy for you, and then I want to unpack it together. Mine's the inverse of what you were talking about, TK. Rich people are not immune to the poverty mindset. Mm. I grew up really poor in a home that was filled with dysfunction, food stamps, government assistance, but also we had been evicted a few times, and we just lived paycheck to paycheck. Often we didn't have a paycheck. And so it made living really difficult. And I thought the reason we were so unhappy growing up is we didn't have much money. And so when I turned 18, I went out and I got that corporate job and I started making some good money. By age 19, I was making $50,000 a year. I was paying my mom's rent, but I still had a poverty mindset. I carried forward many of the habits from my childhood. I was spending more money than I made. 
I was broke. I made really good money. I started making even more money, but I was spending toward the next promotion. I was spending money I didn't have, Mm. charging it to credit cards, to impress people I didn't like with things I didn't need. In fact, those things often got in the way of living meaningfully. So I've got this article here that I wanted to run by you real quick. Our good friend, Dave Ramsey, we'll put a link to this in the show notes over at theminimalists.com slash podcast, 25 things poor people waste money on. I wonder how many of these I wasted money on when I was growing up really poor. Number one, designer baby clothes. Well, I didn't have a baby, so thankfully... (laughs) I didn't buy any designer baby clothes. Infants quickly outgrow their clothes. Investing in inexpensive, in expensive di- designer clothes where for babies can be unnecessary uh, expense. And so let's talk about this real quick. In fact, we'll go through a few of these. We're often buying things to signal. And I think that's what Jennifer's talking about here. Look how together my baby is. My baby has become an accessory that I've accessorized with more accessories, right? But of course, a baby has never complained that they didn't have the Tommy Hilfiger or the Louis Vuitton um, uh, outfit. Expensive coffees. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I often bought things that uh, I spent money on coffee all the time. And there's nothing wrong with buying coffee, but if I don't have the money for it, it's probably not the best use of that money to go and buy a $5 cup of coffee across the street when I can make it at home for 50 cents. Trendy clothes. This was a big one where I grew up. I have friends who had a $1,000 outfit on who were taking the bus. Not that there's anything wrong with taking the bus. I think it's great. But they weren't taking the bus because they wanted to take the bus. They couldn't afford a car. But clearly they could afford the car, but they just didn't have a $1,000 jacket on. That's enough to buy the a beater by, by yourself, right? New cars instead of used cars. Yeah, that's a difficult one. Luxury apartments, high-end makeup, pre-made meals, high-cost mobile service plans, unnecessary tech upgrades, expensive vacations, furniture on credit cards. Well, you know me. If you have to charge it to a credit card, you can't afford it. If you have to charge something to a credit card, by definition, you can't afford it. It doesn't mean you're evil. It doesn't mean you're bad. But if you can't afford something, why punish your future self in order to acquire that impulse purchase right now? Expensive cable packages, impulsive purchase, high interest credit cards, unused gym memberships, dining out frequently, alcohol and cigarettes. Yeah, I'll tell you that Where I grew up, everyone drank and smoked. Everyone. We grew up in a really poor neighborhood. Everyone smoked. Everyone drank. Why is that? So I'm of the opinion that rich people do all all these things too. Like, I, I don't think stupidity and sin, if I can use that word, and shortcomings respect economic boundary lines at right. all, right? Um, richer people have a superior ability to conceal it, to insulate themselves from the ordinary consequences that are baked into things, to bail themselves out, or they've got a longer um, uh, amount of runway to where they can be irresponsible for a longer period of time before the signs start to show up. Whereas if all you got is five bucks, and you spend it on a $5 cup of coffee, man, that really hurts. You got a lot of money. A $5 coffee ain't necessarily a better decision just because you have a lot of money. It still might be a waste. It's just, you know, you're not going to feel that pain. So I think, I think everybody makes these kinds of decisions, but you know, I've seen a lot of scenarios where people go into like, let's say inner city schools, right? And they say things like, you're wearing a $200 pair of gym shoes. You need to be spending that money on a stock market. Um, imagine for a minute, imagine for a minute, there's a homeless guy that's asking you for uh, $10, right? And you give him $10 and he goes to buy some bulls and you're like, dude, what are you doing? You need to be spending that on stocks. <laughs> well, he's probably going to look to you and be like, what? Like that doesn't even feel accessible to him, right? But he does have pain that he needs to medicate. And in terms of what feels accessible to him, in terms of what he knows and his network and what his options are, going through the steps to get that bottle of booze, 
I got the skill set. I got the connections. I got the means to do it. No difficulty there. But all the things you're telling him that he ought to do with that $10, it feels like another world. It feels like he has to learn Greek just to even begin. And, you know, when you look at somebody that has the $200 pair of shoes, I'm not saying that's the best decision, but we got to understand psychologically, sociologically why that happens. Part of why that happens is because it's a valuable signal in that context. Mm -hmm. In those contexts, sometimes what you wear and don't wear can determine whether or not you get bullied. What you wear and don't wear can determine your ranking in the social hierarchy, how many privileges you get, how much support you get, how much protection you get, how many friends you get to have. And those kinds of things are important for mental health. So we don't have to say this is the best way to do something in order to paint an empathetic picture as to why people do it, given what they have access to. And so I just think it's the kind of thing where People do it because it serves as a valuable economic signal, as a valuable social tool within this world of what they have access to and what they know how to do. Does that make sense? Yeah. What you're saying is what I started with that pithy answer is no one's immune to that poverty yeah. mindset, right? Yeah. And you're right. That $5 cup of coffee, if a rich person buys it, they actually might just be buying some time for them. It's worth more to them to not have to make it on their own, right? But when I was really poor and when I left the corporate world, I became poor again. I made $23,000 that first year, but I was more financially stable because I started making better decisions. I started thinking about it. And ultimately what we're talking about here is when we don't think about the decisions that we make, when we're not intentional, it's easy to be wasteful. If we're not thinking about it, quite often what's happening is everyone else is making those decisions for yeah. us. I should have these $200 shoes. I should have this $1,000 jacket or whatever it is. It doesn't make you evil or wrong, but if you want to stay stuck in that cycle, well, continue to be unintentional with the purchasing decisions that you make. We're going to check in with the live stream question here in a moment. First Friday of every month, we do the Friday afternoon minimalist Zoom with the minimalist. Anyone who subscribes to the video version of the private podcast hops on a Zoom call with us. We also record it if you want to watch it after the fact as well. And you can hop on there. You can just be a fly on the wall. You can turn your camera off if you want, or you can come on camera with us and we can have a beautiful conversation together the first Friday of every month. Patreon.com slash The Minimalist. We'll check in with one of the questions from that in a moment. But first, real quick, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of The Minimalists. I have a free ebook out there. It's called 15 Ways to Write Better. I teach a writing class. It's called How to Write Better. I've been teaching it for over a dozen years now. And inevitably, people come to me and say, I just want to learn how to write better. And I teach this class two or sometimes three times a year. And I say, if you give me 30 days, I will show you how to write better. I'm not going to turn you into... Uh, David Foster Wallace or Jonathan Franz and our Mary Carr necessarily, but I will so radically improve your writing. I've had doctors take the class. I've had high school students take the class and everyone in between. And what I've learned is a rising tide lifts all boats. And I show people how to overcome the resistance and the obstacles so they can actually write something that is compelling to them. The final class of this year is on October 2nd. I'll put a link to it in the show notes, howtowritebetter.org. You can get on the email list over there. You can also download my free ebook over there. It's called 15 Ways to Write Better. If you want some simple writing tips and shorter writing lessons as well, you can follow How to Write Better on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. A lot of short writing lessons out there that I think you'll enjoy. In Alabama, let's check in with the Friday afternoon minimalist Zoom do we have any questions or comments from our most recent Patreon Zoom? We sure do. Here's a question from Elena. Do you have specific tips for keeping a space minimal, but still warm and inviting? It depends on what you mean by warm and inviting, because what is warm and inviting to me may not be warm and inviting to TK. In fact, it might be off-putting to him. He might say, oh, this is stark or sterile, right? Mm -hmm. And so who do you want it to be warm and inviting to? When I'm making my home, I want to make it warm and inviting to the people who spend the most time there. And that's mm -hmm. my family. Yeah. And so the three people that I'm considering the most are me and my wife and my daughter. And then if other people find it warm and inviting, then it's a beautiful byproduct. But if they don't, they come over and they say, oh, 
I could never live in a place like this. Or in fact, the opposite often happens. The house I bought a few years ago, the kitchen is so hideously blue. <laughs> if you're a Patreon subscriber, you know I've done some home tours. And the thing that I hate about my home the most is the blue kitchen. But some people come over and they're like, I love this kitchen. And if I just wanted to appease other people, I would keep that kitchen there in perpetuity. But it's about me in this home. and I don't enjoy that kitchen space. So when I've saved up enough money, mm. we'll completely gut and remodel the kitchen to make it warm and inviting to me. And if someone else likes it, great. And if not, well, that's okay too. Yeah. I would say within the realm of what's affordable, design your place in a way that makes you feel warm and inviting. And when you bring people into your place they will feel warm and invited because that's the energy that you radiate. And then you can show them that painting on the wall that they don't care anything about. And you'll be so warm and so inviting when you talk about it that they'll be like, oh, that's kind of cool. When people come to my place, I take them straight to my bookshelf because that's what makes me feel warm and inviting. And I go, oh, my graphic <laughs> novels are over here. And, and here's the book on systems thinking. And their eyes are glazed over. They're completely bored. They don't care anything about my books. But I'm so warm and inviting with my books. They go, man, I, I like how much you love your books, man. Yes. That's kind of cool to see. The way people feel when they are in your space is a reflection of the energy that you radi radiate. So design it for you. Yeah, I think that's a great point. In fact, on the private podcast every week, we do a, f a photo minimalist home tour. And we look inside all of our patrons' homes, our own homes as well. You can see TK's home. You can see several pictures from my home. But our patrons show a bunch of different ways to make it warm and inviting. And some of those you'll look at and say, oh, that's actually cluttered to me. Or, oh, that doesn't have enough personality to me, whatever it might be. This week we have a, a living room, this beautiful living space with a lot of space for living. And I see it as warm and inviting. And I'm wondering if y'all see it that way as well. We'll see that over on the private podcast in a bit. But in the meantime, Alabama, what else you got for us? Here's a minimalist insight from one of our listeners. Hey, y'all. My name is Kristen and I'm a Patreon member. I have a minimalist insight that I've found so much value in. So I wanted to share with you. I've been on a minimalist journey for several years now, and I've managed to let go of so much stuff, and it's really felt freeing. But I've continued to cling to my hard copy photos, even though I've scanned and saved them and backed them up. Up until this year, I felt so attached to them. So I finally decided to commit to letting go of the thousands of photos I've collected over the years, going all the way back to my great-grandparents. One way I was able to bid farewell to these printed photos was to choose some of my favorites and send them to a dear friend who would find just as much joy in these memories and would want to hear about the stories. It was an experience for her to walk down memory lane with me. I enjoyed putting together a bundle of the photos to send to her for her birthday as a unique experience. I labeled each photo and told a story knowing that she's someone who will treasure these photos as much as I do. It allowed me to get closure from the many lives I feel like I've lived in these photos and say goodbye to some of the baggage I was clinging to. I assured her once she was done looking through the pictures that it was okay to throw them away. It was a fun and different way to celebrate life and I accomplished something I had previously struggled with letting go of. I have no regrets and it was healing in a way. I hope someone else can find this exercise as useful and therapeutic as I did. All right, y'all, we'll see you on Patreon for the full two-hour maximal edition of episode 410, which includes answers to a bunch more questions like, what is the source of your unhappiness? How do you cope with decluttering fatigue? What can I do to prevent childhood trauma? and my kids, and a bunch more questions over there on the Minimalist Private Podcast. Also this week, besides our Minimalist Home Tour, we have a deep dive into the burden of inheriting all of those sentimental items that you don't want, plus much, much more of less. And if you want to hear all that, visit patreon.com slash The Minimalist or click the link in the description to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly maximal episodes play in your favorite podcast app. You'll also gain access to all of our podcast archives all the way back to episode 001. That was back in 2015. And if you're still on the fence, Patreon is now offering free trials. So 
If you'd like to test drive our private podcast, you can join for seven days for free. That is our minimal episode for today. If you leave here today with just one message, let it be this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Peace. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'll be fine without it